So then we have 10 o'clock and I think it's time to start with our webinar today. So welcome everyone and I would like to ask Santiago also to share my small presentation for the welcome and also setting the background of today's webinar. Julia, are you there? Mm. It would seem she's kind of frozen, right? Yes, I think uh, she's frozen. Uh, Julia, please uh, log out and log in. I think you have technical issues now. Yeah, uh, I, I just had Julia on the phone and she's her, her computer crashed, so she's restarting everything. Okay, so just wait uh, two or three minutes, please. Yes. Sorry mm. for that. Mm. You're muted, Julia. Okay, so now I'm back and I hope this will not happen again during this meeting. I'm so sorry. So let's quickly jump into the presentation and I would like to start actually with some housekeeping rules. So um, before we start, let's talk about the housekeeping rules during this webinar. So we will have now four presentations and then we will have a short panel discussion. And after this, there will be a first round of question and answers. And I would like to invite everyone to use the chat and only the chat to raise their questions. And we will address them. So me and Ivan will address them to the speakers. So during this question and answer session, please indicate your name, your job position and organization when writing your question, as well as the speaker, the question should go to. And for the case we do not have enough time to answer all the questions, me, you may also state your email and we will try to answer your question after the webinar. Or you can check our webpage where we may upload the questions with answers afterwards. For our experts in the Zoom meeting, please mute your mics and switch off your cameras. And please stay in the Zoom meeting after the streaming if uh, is ending. So we will notify you again at the end of the webinar. So please then stay connected and you will then have the chance for a second round of questions and answers. And please be aware that we are recording this meeting and we will publish the recording afterwards as well as the presentations of today's webinar. Before we start with the topic of genetic diversity today and drought adaptation, I would also like to set the frame of this event within the work of Forest Europe and briefly introduce you to our current is approach of establishing the Pan-European Forest Risk Facility. Next slide, please. Forest Europe, formerly also known as the Ministerial Conference for the Protection of Forests in Europe, originated in 1990 
to improve the concerning status of European forests vitality as a consequence of the industrial emissions in those days. And today it has 45 signatory countries and the EU as members, as well as many observer organizations such as PEFC, FSC, CEPF and USTAFOR. Since its foundation in 1990, it is well known for the definition and the concept of sustainable forest management and the report on the state of Europe's forests that is published in collaboration with FAO and UNSCE every five years, using data from national inventories as backbone and making them more comparable. It also led to the establishment of Eufrogen in 1994, with a valuable role in conserving forest genetic diversity. And also today, Eufrogen continues to be an implementation mechanism of the Forest Europe. And we're very happy that we were able to jointly organize this webinar today with the support of, uh, sorry, Eufrogen. And the chair of Forest Europe is rotating every four years currently. And Germany is the chair from 2021 till 2024. So from next year, 2025 on, a new country will take over. During the German chairmanship, the work has also focused on the establishment of the forest risk facility. We all know that there's an increasing effect of climate change on our forests, causing dramatic damages experienced all over Europe. So in 2021, ministers responsible for forestry agreed to work towards the establishment of a pan-European forest risk facility under Forest Europe. Excuse me, Julia. Uh, yes. The slides are not uh, changing. Next slide. Sorry, I forgot. Thank you. Yes. So on this slide, you can see what we have done during the last one and a half years of the during in the pilot of the forest risk facility. In recognition that forest damages are not respecting national borders, they don't stop at national borders. This forest risk facility has the aim to serve as a cross-country contact platform to connect national experts and share and exchange knowledge and build capacity for prevention, preparedness, recovery and response at a pan-European level. So during the last one and a half years, the facility was focusing on wildfires, on bark beetle outbreaks as an example of a biotic agent and on windstorm events. And all of these are major forest risks that we have been focusing on. Throughout these one and a half years, we were holding workshops and expert group meetings that were forming a common understanding for these topics. And we were also summarizing the results in, in policy briefs that are supposed to give recommendations to policymakers and can be seen as useful guidelines for practitioners. And all of the material is also available on our webpage, so feel free to check it out. And during all of these uh, events and workshops that we have held, we, rec we saw that there is a recognized added value by the signatories and the observers. So. We are currently preparing the documents for the full-scale launch. So we, from this pilot, we want to start in 2025 a continuous uh, forest risk facility. And for this, we need the commitment of the ministers. So at the end of this year, at the ministerial conference in 2024, we hope that all ministers will give their signature to start this facility, the forest risk facility from 25 on at a full scale launch. Until then, we will of course continue with our important work, raising awareness for forest risks, currently focusing on one of the major threats to forests today, drought stress. And we hope that we will continue and be able to uh, better connect science, policy and practitioners, and of course the public. Next. And with this, I would like to hand over to Ivan, Ivan Scotti from the For Genius Project for some general information on the topic and on the For Genius Project. Thank you very much.
back here. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, right. Um, maybe we can start with the following slide. Um, thank you all for attending this meeting. As you know, uh, as you may know, this meeting is co-hosted by the uh, Four Genius Research Program. Uh, yeah, we can, we can go to to the next slide. Uh, and the, just just to briefly introduce you the goals and the and the the the, the, the features of this program. It runs from 2021 to 2025. It's funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 uh, pro framework program. And so we are into the fourth year of the program and the goals uh, of the uh, for Genius are to um, use uh, high-tech uh, advanced tech, uh, methods to uh, characterize the network of genetic conservation units that is run by Euphorgin in at the European level, Europe in the sense of continent, uh, not of the European Union, and to so group these things together uh, from remote sensing, genomics, uh, advanced uh, phenotyping strategies to uh, address the question of resilience and long-term stability of this network of genetic conservation units. Uh, this is going to be funneled into a new uh, information system in which we will increase the quality and the quantity of the uh, data available to the end users to uh, analyze the status of the conservation network and of their own conservation, uh, national conservation policies. Uh, this is going to have also the goal to homogenize the information that the different countries uh, put together in the, in the information system so that uh, the uh, uh, indicators and the values that we obtain to describe this uh, the information in this network of conservation units is interoperable across countries and comparable directly. And this is at the end uh, of the day will be um, uh, made available to the end users through a new interface with the information system that is going to be entirely user friendly and will allow uh, the uh, the users to uh, entirely customize the reports they can get from the database. So that's going to be, we believe, this is going to be a very important lever lever to to better handle the uh, conservation strategies of European forests. Uh, okay, apart from, apart from presenting you for genius, I have the quite hard task to uh, introduce to you some concepts that my colleagues and myself will use further down the event. Um, and so, uh, next slide, please. The I'd like to introduce a few words to a few concepts. Uh, basically, uh, epigenetics and heritability, uh, uh, which go together, genetics, epigenetics, and heritability. So whatever pertains to the uh, things that are determined, driven by the genetic setup of an individual, the environment, so how environments uh, affects the way that uh, 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 populations and trees um, uh, will uh, behave, uh, will survive or die or be affected. Um, and then plasticity, uh, which is uh, the way that uh, the physical features of, of the trees change with the, uh, under the impact of environment. So uh, I, I take the opportunity here to, to say that today we will focus on the direct effects of drought. Of course, there is a larger picture to take into account because there are many stressors uh, that can affect uh, the forests, but to, and, and they will certainly interact, for example, drought with pest uh, attacks and so on and so forth. But today, for the sake of simplicity, we will focus only on the direct effects of drought. Um, okay, uh, to explain briefly uh, the this, this few concepts, uh, I will not use uh, examples from trees, but if we go to the next slide, I will have a, use a very simple picture which is not trees, obviously. Uh, and, and I will use this, this picture to illustrate the few, few concepts. So as you can see here, this is a, a, a small family of people, probably at, uh, at the seashore. 
And what do we see here? We see that they look alike somehow. Um, but why do they look alike? So let's go to the to the next slide, please. The first thing that, 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 that they are very similar for are their, their, their swimming suits. Of course, they look similar. Uh, the, the three individuals look similar because they wear the same things. Of course, this is, this is not determined by their genes. This is what we call uh, uh, the effect of the environment. That is, they share the same environment. They are all at the beach. And so they wear uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the clothes that they need to stay at the beach. And possibly, they probably bought, the, bought, bought all these things, uh, all this wear from the same shop. So they look very similar. So this is what we could say it is an environmental effect. Let's move to the next slide, please. They also look somehow similar. Uh, maybe it's not automatically evident from the picture, but they probably look similar in their physical features uh, because they are related. They are, they, they are father and son, mother and son. Uh, and so because of this, uh, they look similar to each other. And in any case, they will probably look more similar to each other than they would look uh, than they would do with another unrelated individual. And that's basically the roots of the, all the concepts in genetics. If you are related, then you look similar. And you look similar because of inherited uh, properties that go through one way or another your genes. So your, your DNA, your chromosomes that are inherited from one generation to the other. That's the genetic component of similarity. Of course, as I said, your genetic setup doesn't determine what you wear, uh, but it determines your traits. We can move to the next slide. Plasticity. So plasticity is uh, it means that your traits, your characters, your physical features may change over time. For example, uh, the young kid will probably one day uh, develop hair in his face over his face like his father because he will grow up. Uh, and so he will change his, his characters because of his development. But it's probable, it's likely that these three people, if they stay at the beach every day, maybe over a few, few, few weeks, their, their skin will get darker because it will respond to, to the environmental uh, conditions. And so they will get a tan uh, or a sunburn. Uh, and uh, and so they change the, the, their characters. We call them plastic. So meaning that they can be shaped by the the uh, the environmental conditions. So uh, that's uh, these are these are the concepts I wanted to to just to introduce. Um, and so now the question is, how do the, these concepts apply? to trees and the effects of droughts on, on, the, on trees. And that's, uh, and that's what we are going to do in, during the event. So uh, my colleagues and myself will go through different aspects of these concepts, uh, looking at how uh, the different uh, components that drive uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, physiological and physical features of trees and forests uh, are, are conditioned and determine the response uh, to drought. So I think I will stop here and uh, and and hand the the the, the floor back to to Julia. Thank you very much. I will quickly introduce our first speaker, Maurizio Mancocini. He's an ICREA research professor at the Ecolog Ecological and Forestry Applications Research Center, CREAF, in Barcelona, and an honorary professor of forest science at the University of Edinburgh. And he will commence with insights into the impacts of climate change on the physiology of trees and forests and illustrate what happens to trees during and after drought. The floor is yours, Maurizio. <clears throat> Thank you, Julia, uh, uh, for the introduction. Uh, we can proceed to my presentation if you want. Thank you. Uh, one next slide, please. And so I'll I'll um, <clears throat> I'll uh, briefly uh, uh, structure my talk with regard to saying a few things about uh, uh, introduction introducing concepts. That concepts related to, to droughts, effects on trees, how trees respond to uh, droughts, especially 
uh, also a focus on when droughts are repeated over time. I will then zoom in to say a few words about um, which traits uh, are important. The traits are the characteristics of the trees that constitute the appearance of the tree. Uh, sometimes we call it also the phenotype to distinguish it from the genotype that uh, that uh, was mentioned uh, by Ivan in the previous talk. And I will end up by uh, att attempt to emphasize the significance of uh, uh, these traits in the context of changes in, in climate. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so I will begin by uh, showing this uh, uh, recent reanalysis of the climatic data that uh, show on the left hand side uh, long term trends in um, in uh, an index called SPI, which is a, an index of if you want uh, what's it called the meteorological drought. It's uh, the the, the, uh, the ratio between the precipitation and the evapotranspiration at each site. So when uh, uh, this uh, uh, Index is very negative, it's got brown colors. It means that uh, there's a very strong drought uh, going on in, 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 the, in the particular uh, cell of, of this map where the, where the uh, uh, values are in the blue range or the green range, instead is the opposite, is uh, it's uh, evidence of lack of drought. So uh, very wet conditions in the, in the particular cell. Whereas the two figures to the right uh, illustrate the same maps, but for the two years of 2018 and 2022, which were years of extreme, uh, extreme droughts in Europe. So in effect, you have on the left, the trends over the four last uh, four decades, um, and slightly more in fact, of the spring and summer drought across Europe. And you have on the right, the last two figures, uh, what has happened during two specific uh, events to specific years when we had extreme droughts events occurring. And the point I wanted to make simply is that, as you can see, the spatial distribution of those extreme events are different according to the two years and according to the season, spring and summer, and they are also very different compared to the locations of the um, long-term trends in, in um, uh, soil droughts across across Europe. So the point essentially is this: that uh, uh, no two droughts are identical. They, every every drought is different in its characteristic, in its intensity, in its duration, uh, in its severity, essentially. <clears throat> and so uh, it, it, it the effect that we can expect from uh, from increasing uh, severity of droughts due due to climate change are probably uh, uh, location specific and real dependent on exactly the conditions that occur at each particular point in space. And uh, next slide, please. A second concept I want to introduce is that we don't know, we don't only have um, uh, drought events occurring in the soil. We also have another process which is referred to as atmospheric aridification. In other words, uh, as a consequence of the atmosphere becoming warmer, uh, we uh, also have a, an effect on the apparent uh, water availability for the plants or water demand from the atmosphere. It, this uh, concept of atmospheric aridification can be quantified, for example, using uh, relative humidity or another property which is shown here, which is called the VPD, which is the deficit in the pressure of the vapor in the air. And so uh, again, the figure shows as in the previous slide, the, the, the temporal trends, the long-term temporal trends of the last four decades in the top left, and the top right shows that these events have been uh, stronger in tropical and the arid regions, these uh, temporal trends over the last four decades, and at the bottom larger, a map shows that uh, it's been occurring pretty much across the entirety of, uh, of the European continent, with the exception uh, of the Atlantic fringe, the British Isles and Scandinavia. And it's a very different pictures if you compare uh, the Europe with, uh, for example, North America, where instead these trends are very much localized to a fraction of that continent. 
So again, here, uh, there is a, <clears throat> the point I wanted to make is that there is a difference between uh, uh, the long-term trends and what can happen during extreme events of hot years or heat waves when this atmospheric aridification is particularly intense. Next slide, please. And so essentially what we are saying is that uh, locally we have more severe soil droughts. Uh, generally, we are going to be seeing higher vapor pressure deficit in the atmosphere. So we have problems in the soil with the roots accessing the water. We have problems in, at the top of the trees in, uh, in losing water to the atmosphere. That little picture on the right is uh, the picture of a, of a cell called stomata. This, this cell control in the leaves how much water the leaves lose. And so uh, the, the plants act actively attempt to avoid to become dry, uh, drier and more de desiccated. But of, of course, this is dependent on the availability of the water in the soil. And so it's not only a question of having longer mega droughts, longer and more intense droughts in the soil. It's also a question of having water droughts. Next slide, please. And so then this forces us to look at the water content inside uh, plants, uh, in this case trees, and the water content uh, is some of the trees is uh, somewhere in between the water content of the soil and the water content of the atmosphere. Uh, it affects a, a range of properties that have to do at the top right with the productivity of, of annual plants and crops, but also uh, perennial plants like trees and and, and the services that they provide. The, this water content affects the interaction of the trees with the uh, pathogens or insects or, or other organisms that uh, attack the trees. And water content also affects a number of properties like flammability and the fuel moisture content, which then are, are very important to uh, uh, control and determine the risk of fire and the behavior of the fire. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what happens during uh, severe droughts then? Essentially what happens is that uh, trees go through a spiral uh, that uh, it, it is, it's initiated by the occurrence of uh, drought in the soil and a hotter temperature and so drier air. We, this increases uh, the tension that occurs inside the conduits that transport the water from the roots of the plants to the leaves. And uh, we call this conduit xylem. And, and eventually, and, and this uh, and drought causes the development of an events in the, in the xylem, which is called cavitation. And essentially, they are like air bubbles that uh, disrupt the water supply in the in the in, in these conduits. Uh, eventually, uh, the, the tree loses water, loses its reserves, and enters into a spiral that eventually may lead to um, uh, lack of recovery and mortality. One click, please. Yeah, and so if there is one event only, then uh, uh, we can have total or partial recovery. Uh, click, please. If we have multiple events, instead uh, we can only have a partial recovery or no recovery at all. And eventually all this damage that, that is caused by one drought event, it, it accumulates in the tree and over Repeated events then eventually leads to um, uh, the damages becoming permanent and so leading to mortality eventually. Next slide. So which, which ones are the traits uh, uh, that affect these uh, drought responses? And again, the traits are the, sort of the building blocks of this uh, phenotype of the tree, uh, the appearance of the tree, the morphology, the physiology, the the seasonality of the tree, et cetera, all those aspects that contribute to uh, the, the appearance and the behavior of the tree. So uh, it's a long list of uh, characters that contribute to this um, drought responses, but it's not an in infinitely large list. The list is large because uh, every drought is different. So we look at aspects that have to do with the regulation or against the mild droughts that are only a short duration, which primarily affect the productivity of crops, for example. But we're also looking at traits that really affect the sensitivity and the vulnerability of the trees to mortality. So there is a large range of con contributions that uh, control this um, in overall response strategies of the trees to drought. Next slide. 
And so taking the example from Forginius, uh, the project that uh, Ivan has already introduced, uh, the contribution of, of the part of the project which I lead has to do with three aspects. One is the quantification of the variability of all those traits that contribute to the appearance of the tree, its phenotype. Then assessing the relative contribution of the various components of diversity across all this network of conservation units and within each of these units, in other words, the phenotypic, the genotypic, and the environmental diversity. And then attempting to assess the significance of this variability with regard to how uh, these populations respond to drought events. Next slide, please. So this is one example of a preliminary data set of four species. Uh, we will uh, we have in fact a larger data set already, and we will finish the field uh, sampling this year, reaching a total of, of ten species analyzed. Uh, ten species will be the most important three species that are, are uh, <clears throat> relevant for European forests, but also a number of species which, for a number of reasons, are, are particularly sensitive to climate change or, or have a particular genetic structure. So an example here for four of these 10 on the columns uh, and on the, row, on the rows, you have um, a selection of six exemplary traits that we quantified here. The list is longer, but uh, I to keep the figure um, visible, I uh, trimmed it to six. And essentially what you look at is uh, just the variability, a figure that shows the, the distribution of the values of these traits. And so values are centered around the value of zero. You can see the scale at the bottom and go from negative four to plus four, which means that there is a large, relatively large range of variability of these traits. And you can see that most of the times um, uh, the curve look like a, a bell-shaped curve, and it, it, the range suggests that there is a substantial diversity of these traits uh, across and within uh, uh, each of these uh, genetic conservation units. You can also see there's some cases of curves which are very spiked, suggesting that uh, certain traits for certain species are much less variable than others. So this is also very, very interesting. Next slide, please. So here I take an example of three of those traits, SLA uh, and P50 and KS, which are, were also plotted in the, in the previous slide. I don't necessarily need to tell you what they mean in practice, uh, 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 but simply I'm trying to make the point that when we examine the variability of each one of these traits, we also need to consider how they covary with one another because Often uh, it's the covariation of the individual trees which uh, uh, is important. And so in, in this particular example, uh, <clears throat> we look at traits which have to do with the safety of the hydraulic system uh, to transport the water from the roots to the leaves and the efficiency of the hydraulic system. And so again, the efficiency of the transport system uh, uh, from, from the roots to the leaves. So a, a system is safe when it's very resistant to drought and, efficient, and the system is efficient when it's uh, capable of transporting quickly, very rapidly, water from the roots to the leaves. Uh, on the x-axis, instead, I show uh, SLA. SLA is a measure of uh, the structure of the leaves, uh, whether leaves are uh, thick or thin, or uh, very dense or not very dense. These sort of properties, which are important, even though they are not um, uh, um, uh, related to the physiology, they are only related to the morphology of one organ, the leaf. They are nonetheless very important because, as you can see, they relate also to properties which are measured in the wood of the of the organ of the plant. So, I simply uh, the graphic makes the point that uh, we need to consider. Sorry, can you go back to the slide, please? It makes the point that you need to consider uh, how the properties uh, uh, co vary together as opposed to individually. Next slide, please. Maurizio, please come to an end. That's the one. And so this is the final slide and show that in fact, when we examine, uh, we use one model to uh, analyze the effect of one specific property P50 on the 
time that is uh, necessary for the plant to fail hydraulically, then we can see differences that occur both within the gene conservation unit as well as across. And so this, these properties are therefore important to quantify the drought risks that the plants are subjected to. And so that uh, you can see there is variability within on each gene conservation unit as well as across gene conservation units. And the traits is related to the response of the plant to drought. Uh, next slide, please. And so the synthesis is this one here uh, that uh, we see substantial phenotypic variability in hydraulic traits. The components is probably linked to the genetics and another one to the plasticity, although we still have to uh, separate these two components properly. And these differences are important for how each individual tree and each GCU differ in terms of their performance during and after droughts. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very circumference introduction also to drought and the physiology behind it. We will come now to the next presentation by Delphine Grivet and Aida Sole Medina, both researchers at the Institute of Forest Sciences, EC4, at INIA, CSIC in Madrid. And they will take us on a journey investigating the genetic diversity among and within tree species and unravel the genetic basis of such variation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Julia. Uh, sorry if you hear some noise. I think there is some construction around me today, but I will do my best. So, um, if we can have the presentation, please. So, um, next slide. So, Mauricio just uh, presenting some uh, insights of a response of tree uh, to drought. Um, from a phenotypic point of view. But we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, in trees, when they react to any stressor, drought or any other ones, there will be a coordinated answer that involves uh, uh, many uh, responses from uh, an adjustment from a morphological, physiological, and otromolecular point of view. So in this talk, uh, all, I mean, we will focus on only one of them, the genetic level, Next slide, please. And we should keep in mind that all these uh, processes, they interact with each other, but also with the environment. Uh, and we will see how genetic variation uh, within uh, a species is important to, to adapt to these stressors and drought. Next, please. So as uh, Eva mentioned in the introduction, um, since uh, trees, they are sessile and long-lived species, they need to adapt when they are under uh, climatic change. Uh, they have two main evolutionary mechanisms to do that, uh, phenotypic plasticity, which is high in trees, and also they, have, they do it through adaptation uh, with their uh, intraspecific uh, genetic variability. I'm just presenting here two species that are uh, using both strategy, but in a different way. Uh, so we have on the top uh, the stone pine, Pinus pinea, which shows weak evidence of intraspecific genetic variability related to climate gradients. So this means that uh, uh, in this species, there is an increased role of phenotypic plasticity. While the species on the bottom, uh, Mediterranean pine, uh, Pinus pinaster, shows strong evidence of intraspecific genetic variability in relation to climate gradients. And uh, this means that the populations are genetic genetically adapted to the climate of origin. And we will see some e example in this talk uh, later on. Next slide, please. So if we focus on uh, Mediterranean pines, uh, you have here the phylogenetic relationships of six of them for which, uh, so native from the Mediterranean regions and for which we have a wealth of genetic data available. You can see that uh, that's an, an heterogeneous assembly of species with uh, different biogeographic and demographic histories. However, next please, we can also uh, see some common patterns. Next, please. And we can see an increasing genetic diversity for high elevation species, 
and also an increasing intraspecific genetic diversity from west to west in the Mediterranean basin. So this uh, pattern, common pattern, are um, related to a common past history linked to climate change, a ch a change sorry, and also to um, adaptation to regional specificities. However, next slide, please. If we look at this uh, species individually, we can see also some differences. On this map, you can see um, some molecular genetic data. So each circle corresponds to a population and a color to a genetic group. So first of all, we can see that there are differences among the, the spine in terms of the spatial distribution of, of the genetic variation. And most importantly, we have a genetic variation within and among population. So this is really important. And this is an asset for this species because this will um, uh, allow natural selection to act on these uh, genotypes, on the genetic viability, and to select the genotypes be best adapted to a, speci a specific environment. Uh, so when we look at this uh, genetic map, of course, these are the result of different processes, both stochastic from the, from the evolutionary of, uh, history of the species, but also from adaptation. So how do we do to uh, identify the genetic variation associated to adaptation? Next slide, please. So we can look at it from, at it from a molecular perspective. In that case, what we usually, we usually do is to combine genotype, uh, phenotype, and environment. And we try to find some association among them. So this will give us some insight of uh, the genes that are involved uh, in specific phenotypes, but also uh, what is the driver of selection in terms of climatic variable that is behind this adaptation. So an as an example, on the right side, you can see a graph showing a genotype uh, located from one nucleotide, located in a gene uh, that is involved in a response to, uh, to heat stress. And uh, we can see the, the association of this genotype with winter temperature. So if you look at the GG genotype, you can see that it's associated with warmer temperature, while the AA genotype is associated with colder temperature. So we can see that there, there, are, there are differences for this, for this, uh, for this uh, genotype. And if we also can associate the genotype for a specific phenotype, for example, the GG genotype is associated with uh, more survival or higher growth, then we could put, integrate this information into a range shift model, and we could uh, um, project this model to the future uh, distribution of the species. And also we can use this um, information at the population level to guide future, I mean, uh, conservation and management programs. And now I will give the floor to Aida, who will present other approaches. Thank you, Delphine. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, we are going to present another method that is the traditional one when molecular markers were not available. So in nature, as we have uh, seen, uh, there are both genetic and plastic components of the phenotype. And in natural conditions, here you have three examples. These are three different populations of the same species, one in blue, one in yellow, and one in red. And you can see that the phenotypes are different. But in natural conditions, you cannot uh, ascertain whether these differences are in response to the environment or is the result of the evolution of the populations to, the, to their environment. So to disentangle uh, these two components, what we do is to take individuals from each population and grow them in a common environment. So if you take some yellow and red trees and put them together in, uh, with the blue population. So if you study on the same environment, different populations, the differences you see are uh, mostly based on genetics. So it's the result of adaptive evolution 
On the other hand, if you study the same population grown on different environments, it's the same genome, uh, or well, the same molecular background, but the differences with in different sites would be the uh, plastic component. So, so here we bring, uh, sorry, next please. Here we bring an example of a previous uh, European project where we collected seeds from different populations that you can see in gray and black symbols. And taking these seeds, we grown, we uh, sown them on field conditions in Madrid, in uh, Bordeaux, and in Italy. And what we can see comparing in each site, uh, next please. Next slide, please. Okay. So here you can see that uh, populations are adapted to mean annual temperature. There are some populations that show higher fitness. In this case, fitness uh, means that they emerge. So germinate more in the field and also survive more for two years. So there are some populations, the ones that from hotter environments of drought, because a drought, summer drought was the time where most seedlings died. But, but also the populations that came from uh, places with higher precipitation seasonality. Precipitation seasonality uh, means that the, the precipitation is more heterogeneous uh, across the year. So mostly that in summer, there is a lower range. So combining distance better adapted to drought conditions because they survive and emerge more in field. And why is this important? So next, please. Why is this important? Because if you consider this species as a whole, okay, sorry, first, uh, here you can see the results of two models, one taking uh, intraspecific variability into account and the other that do not. In green, you can see where, they, where both models agree that the species can be present. But in yellow, you can see how including the differences among populations, it broadens the area where the, where the species can be present. So uh, yeah, that's why it's very important. Next, please. Here is just uh, to remind, no matter the numbers, but in the columns, you can see different uh, climatic factors, mean annual temperature, annual precipitation, and so on. And it's just to make clear that the clinal variation along climatic gradients is usual in forestry species, but they are particular for each species and trait studied. However, we can make some, we can see some general patterns, some trends. That that uh, populations that come from a grow less in biomass above ground, by, but invest more uh, resources in root growth, which translate in higher drought survival. Next, please. And this is a, a take home message that species are subject to diverse selective pressures across their distribution. And this could write to in forestry species. So conserving and promoting this genetic diversity within species increases the chances that they get adapted to unpredicted environmental conditions. Because there are some populations that are 
pretty adapted to conditions that we expect in other areas in the future. And there also could be genetic variants that are useful in future environmental conditions, but we don't really don't know right now. And this is all from our side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Stefan Maury, Professor of Plant Physiology and Epigenetics at the University of Orléans in France, and a driving force in understanding the evolutionary and functional impact of epigenetic variation in forest trees, and will discuss on the topic epigenetics, what's in it for tree adaptation. Okay, thank you, Yula. Hello to everyone. May I have the first slide, please? Okay, thank you. Next. Okay, so first things, I would like to say that my aim is to clarify for a general uh, audience what we speak when we speak about epigenetics. So maybe you're enthusiastic or afraid by this idea of epigenetics. And my aim during this presentation is to draw mass, as much people as I can to the enthusiastic side. Next. So for that, I will try to take a little time to define what is epigenetic. I think most of the time is a main failure after to explain how it is related to tree adaptation, how we can study epigenetic in trees, just to have an idea of what we are doing in our lab, what we know or we do not know, but it will be quite complex in a so short time. And just to give you an idea about the promise of epigenetics and prospects for forest and this, of course, in a short time. So excuse me for all the lack of details. Next, please. So first things that is really a challenging for a general audience is to explain what is epigenetics. So we can try to say that it's what, ep what genetics cannot explain alone, usually in terms of developmental process and when there is an environmental effect. So for that, you have here a few slides, few pictures to show you, for example, with twins. Most of times, young twins are very similar and getting older and older, they start to differentiate. This trajectory of life with different phenotype is due to their environment. And while they start with the same genome, because these twins are genetically totally identical, they start to diverge with age. And this will be partly due to epigenetics. You can find also things in plants with this uh, floral morphology. You can find a lot of events due to the nutrition. For example, uh, here, uh, bees, the queen are genetically identical to the worker. It's just because they are fed with uh, je royal jelly that they became queens. And it has been shown that it's partly a process of epigenetics. Last this mice with obesity process, like these plants waiting for seasons, memory and flowering. And uh, here these um, uh, organisms that have uh, defense reaction due to their predator. And the most known example is about cancer cells uh, that are differentiate from normal cells, partly due epigenetics and due to environmental effect on cells during all our life. So here, the main idea is to remember that most of time epigenetic, that is in insect, plants, animals, humans, is a problem of developmental process, environmental effect, usually in addition to genetic uh, basis. Next, please. So if now we think about what is epigenetic for most people, for general audience, we can see his discovery of time a few years ago. It said that globally, you are not restricted to your genes. Why your DNA is and your destiny is a question of epigenetic. There is something else than DNA sequence and this something else due to the environmental effect during your life that can be transmitted to the next generation is mostly a question about epigenetics. So it's interesting for people to have idea that their behavior, their life, their environment will affect their genome and can be transmitted to the next generation, especially if you speak about disease. Next, please. But we are also biologists for us. So what is epigenetic for biologists? 
It's a question of, of course, chromosomes that you can see here. These chromosomes are made of DNA and proteins. These proteins are called histones, and they can give structure to the DNA. So the DNA is wrapped around these uh, histones and can be very compact. And the genes are silenced. They cannot express, they cannot give proteins, or they can be open structure. And in this case, the gene can be expressed, give proteins, and have effect. So just the structure of the DNA inside our nucleus, inside our cells, can control our phenotype in response to the environment. And this is the molecular basis of the idea of epigenetics. So for people, for biologists, we are speaking about the same, but for us, we are very interested in the mechanisms. And most of the time, general audience are just interested about what does it change to their life. Okay, next one. To summarize the idea, and first on humans, we can stick take against this idea of twin. So at the beginning, this twin A and B have exactly the same genome. Here we speak about identical twins, same gene, same DNA sequence. And if you look near to the baby, there is this um, chromatin with marks, methylation, for example, that are mostly similar at the beginning. That's why twins are so similar when they are young. If they, during their life, uh, are exposed to different environments, they will progressively diverse about the epigenetic marks. They will change, not exactly the modification at the same place. And this will affect the trajectory of life and also affect the disease susceptibility for these twins that are at the basis exactly the same genome. So if we finish with human, that is maybe more easy to understand this concept. On a genetic basis, of course, we never forget genetic. It's the effect on environment during life, and that can be transmitted, so over generation. If we speak about that, we start to speak about epigenetic. Next, please. So we speak about humans, but uh, trees are also organisms, biological organisms. They have DNA chromosomes and genetic and epigenetic. So how it is related to our questions, it's very simple. You already heard about the presentation. Our global change gives an impact on our forest, and it's now very clear that there is a forest decline all over the world, especially related to drought and to heat stress. And we know that, as it's already shown, they have ability to adapt. And if they adapt, the impact and the consequence on the ecosystemic services will be uh, decreased. Next, please. So where is now the idea of genetic and epigenetic? As uh, Ivan told you, there is phenotypic plasticity, ability of each individual to respond. And there is also the genetic basis, the ability of uh, DNA sequence also to respond during a long time scale to adaptation. And behind these two sides, there is always genetic and epigenetic variability interacting. Maybe what is very specific is that epigenetic is directly under environmental change and can quickly answer to environmental variation and affect plasticity, interact with genetic variability, and during a long time scale can also have some remaining effect. So we have a direct effect on epigenetic because we are still speaking about the effect on environment during the life of the trees and over the generation. So well, I think exactly on the topic. Next, please. So what are we doing? I will not, for a general audience, uh, lead you to too much detail, but we do experience. It's how we can have test hypothesis, give you some evidence, and after some recommendation. So next, this idea of experience uh, in the idea that we use different three genotypes or epigenotypes. I mean that they have the same genomes, but different epigenetic marks. Like we have twins in human, we can have clones for trees. For example, I'm working on poplar, and poplar is mainly propagated as clonal material. So we have clones. These clones have the same genome, but can have different epigenetic marks, like twins, during their life, during do different environment trajectory, with different sensibility to disease. You hear like, like a dwarf response. So they are genetically or epigenetically diverse. And this is what is interesting for us as a starting material. Next. 
Then the idea is to put them in different environments, like it was just present before. We must can use common garden or different places to test for different environmental condition. So plasticity to biotic or abiotic stress, like drought and rewatering, to see how these genotypes and epigenotypes are reacting. Next. Then it's very important that we can assess the phenotypic variability due to this uh, uh, variability of environments and this variability of genotypes and epigenotypes. So there is a lot of ecological studies to do to characterize the physiological answer. Next. Then we need molecular approach like genetic, epigenetic, genomic, working on DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolites, everything, and after connect them and to understand at the molecular level how to characterize this response that is quite complex at the physiological level. Next, please. How to study this? Don't be afraid. It's just that we have evolving strategy. More than 20 years ago, we were limited to biochemical approach, and it was quite hard to understand about epigenetics. After we progressively evolved with electrophoresis, a lot of techniques. What I would like to say is that now, for more than 10 years, we have what we call sequencing. It's a way to generate millions, billions of data that allow us to characterize at the molecular level very precisely the genetic and epigenetic information of each individual. We are now in an area where we can characterize each individual at the molecular, very precise level using sequencing. So we have now very powerful uh, methods to allow us to go very deep in our analysis. I will not detail more, but just uh, to have in mind that we are now in an area where we can do a lot of things. Next, please. So what do we know? This is a trap of this presentation. I cannot answer to that. It's too short. So if you want to know what we do we know, we will need an overview and it cannot be done in so short time. But what I can summarize that we know a lot of things, but we still have only few evidence for each of them. So we have some concept, but we are still lacking and are having a lot of questions. So just like a few examples, please, next. Just few titles of publication. Okay, what we will do? We know first with the first title that epigenetic, here is DNA methylation, affect the draft stress. So you see, trees have an epigenetic component in their draft stress response. First things to know. Secondly, uh, poplar trees show environmental epigenetic memory. When you have a drought during summer, the next year, the trees remind that they have drought the previous year, and they do not react the same the next year. It's not only a question of physiological resources, it's also a question of epigenetic remembering and uh, ability to respond differently with time. And this is something quite new now. And lastly, we must not forget the biotic interaction. I think we do not speak a lot about microbiote, but the tree's answer is also related to the tree's microbiote, and in particular, the root microbiote. And we know that most of the trees from the temperate area and boreal area have mycorrhization, so symbiotic mutualistic relationships with fungus. And this relationship allow them to improve their water and nutrient uptake, so should help them during drought. And what we have shown recently is that epigenetic control this mutualistic interaction. So it's also another way to affect drought response histories. Next. So finally, if I say what we know or not, we know concept. We have clear idea of what happened, but we have only few evidence on very few spaces, on only few experimental design, and we need much more effort. Next. <clears throat> no, yes. <laughs> so if I summarize what we are doing for more than 15 years, not what we know. We know that tree, especially on poplar model, when they have subjected to drought and rewatering cycle, they have epigenetic modification. And this epigenetic modification has two big functions. The first 
they protect the genome against uh, modification and variability. But at, long -term, at the long-term scale, it can also affect the genetic variability and the ability to adapt. And on the other way, at very plastic and short time, they modify globally the hormonal response of the tree and they can uh, allow acclimatation or tolerance to stress. So we know that DNA methylation can have these two roles. We don't know exactly where is exactly the trade-off of this process and especially in different kind of tree spaces. Next, please. So what can we do with epigenetic? The first thing is that we can have a lot of application using epigenetic diversity, like we use genetic diversity, as much for trees with clonal propagation than trees with sexual propagation. Epigenetic has been viewed as a component involving all of this process and can be interesting to develop new material to help for assisted migration or some other question. On the next slide, we will get a short example. Please come to an end. Yes, it's good. So here, colleagues from Norway, they use somatic embryogenesis, so they generate in lab embryos, but they put on cold or warm temperature. And when they put these trees in plantation, they observe that they can control the phenology of the trees. So producing material at different temperature with epigenetic memory can after have repercussion on the phenology. So how and where you can put plant these trees that have different phenology. It can be a way to answer to, to this question. Next, please. Next, please. So in conclusion, I would just would like to say that we need more research to understand. We have concepts and we know that there is interest in epigenetics, but we have only a few examples that have been developed. What we can also say is that with epigenetics, like all omics and genetics uh, data, we can now, now use artificial intelligence and improve prediction model for forest under climate change. And this will be also one very important aim in the future is to develop this kind of data to improve our models and maybe to give better recommendations to the forest management. Okay, thank you. And next one, please. Yes, just to say that I hope that I can maybe now have met more people enthusiastic about this. And if you want to learn more or have some question, you can also further contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I think it was a very good introduction to epigenetics and I'm more enthusiastic now. So Thank you. Concluding, <laughs> concluding with the presentations, I would now invite Iskandia Dimirtas from the General Directorate of Combating Desertification and Erosion in Turkey to the floor. He will offer a vision of the ongoing genetic research carried out on pear, hawthorn and poplar to determine the possibilities of using them for afforestation in arid to semi-arid areas in Turkey. Uh, I think you're muted. We cannot hear you at the moment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Julia. Uh, uh, Julia already said we have uh, some project in our general directorate of uh, combating desertification and soil erosion. And we also have some genetic works there and I will talk about them. I have a short presentation for this. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said, uh, we have some project about the genetic uh, diversity. And Turkey is a rich uh, plant diversity. And global warming and climate change uh, is, neg uh, is negative affecting this uh, in all over the like uh, all over the world and the general directorate of uh, combating desertification and erosion uh, conduct some genetic research about them for uh, sustainable management in arid and semi-arid areas uh, here is the main purpose is preventing 
prevention of soil degradation and also combating desertification and soil erosion. Next slide, please. Uh, first project is uh, genetic resource of how thorn and the second one, again, genetic research of uh, wheat peer. And we, <clears throat> our purpose is here. Uh, we uh, want to see uh, drought tolerance species. Uh, it is including, it includes uh, both of them. Next slide, please. Uh, for the both projects, and we uh, <clears throat> selected 100 natural wild pear and hawthorn trees. Uh, we have some samples uh, in the natures where we can where we can find the wild pear and hawthorn. These are the uh, <clears throat> species uh, you can see the. Uh, arid and semi-arid in Turkey, and we want to see the protect them to uh, climate change and uh, uh, desertification. And because of this, we uh, collected uh, samples from the uh, 20 province in uh, arid and semi-arid regions of Turkey. Next slide, please. Uh, shortly, I want to talk about the uh, project aims. Uh, <clears throat> project of the genetic research of the species, uh, we want to uh, protect them um, to climate change and uh, desertification and also uh, genetic adaptation. Uh, we also, uh, we actually the main uh, purpose uh, we want to use them to uh, uh, plantation in parks and gardens because uh, these plants uh, both of them uh, needs minimal water requirements and we have Turkey uh, has water stress yeah we don't have enough water and <clears throat> uh, also, uh, there's another purpose is carbon sinks uh, by planting these plants in uh, arid and semi-arid areas, areas. Next slide, please. Here's the, some pictures uh, when we collect uh, samples and our uh, genetic source parcels. You can see the parcels here, or we uh, research on them and um, sample collection. These are the just samples. Next slide, please. The, another project is Poplar project. As you know, Poplar is very important for the industry and Turkey has 65% uh, is uh arid areas and we need to use these areas and then uh, we also um, produce the products uh, produce the timber products from the poplars and we started this project in two different uh, cities in Turkey and the city is in located uh, arid and semi actually arid areas and salinity areas. Next slide, please. Uh, 116 poplar clones and one uh, hybrid poplar clone and one silver poplar clone and two uh, willow clones were used for the project. Uh, 35 screens were planted for each clone and totally uh, planted uh, for um, 4,200 uh, uh, coins in totally. The plots were planted in, as I said before, uh, plot, planted in two cities. Uh, one is Aksaray and the second one, the Kirshir. This areas is uh, the salinity areas. 
and we actually the areas cannot use the for agricultural and we want to use them uh, kind of this project and how to get the benefit from the these areas next slide please uh, here is the objective as i said uh, our uh, one of the objective economic benefit benefits for the timber production uh, productivity in sunny areas uh, because of they are not suitable for the agricultural uh, also uh, uh, we need to specify the popular species uh, which one is resistance to drought and extreme conditions uh, also specification of species that requires le less water uh, Next slide, please. Here is the uh, photos from the uh, planted poplars. And after eight years, and some species uh, can be survived. And we just measured them uh, uh, radiance and which species survived just we uh, used them uh, for the uh, research analyze and stat we get some statistical results based on this uh, species next slide please uh, <clears throat> after the statistical analysis uh, we see that the uh, all of the poplar in uh, Aksaray site, all of them died, but in Kirshir site, uh, some poplar uh, survived. That was the six poplar species, and we suggested that uh, people or some land owners can use the uh, this species for the. Uh, timber production and the, just uh, in the salinity areas, we uh, get some suggestion like that. And to, as I said, uh, three projects uh, have been successfully completed. Uh, uh, wild pear and hawthorn species are used to decrease the climate change, climate, climate change and its effects such as the desertification and erosion in the popular project in only seven clones uh, i said six i guess it, uh, it was the seven sorry about that seven clones have successfully survived and adapted the uh, salty areas and they are also now uh, using the uh, new plantations in turkey in turkey in salty areas Next slide, please. Yeah, that's it, I guess. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for these practical insights in the research in Turkey. Mm. We have now finished with the presentations and are going over to the panel discussion, which will be guided by Ivan Scotti. And you're now welcome to raise your questions also in the chat for the discussion for the questions and answers part afterwards. Ivan, to you. Thank you very much, Julia, and thanks to all the speakers for this very high profile, um, uh, the, the high profile presentation. So now this is the way we're going through the panel discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a few questions to our, uh, our speakers and I'll ask them to, to give me some answers. Um, the idea is that I will probably point to individual speakers for some sp questions and so I'll ask them to answer first. But if the others also want to uh, to uh, to comment or, or uh, add anything, they are very much welcome. Um, I'll, I'll just ask all of you to try to be short with your answers as, as far as you can um, and comments so that we can uh have a, a wider uh, coverage of all the topics I, i'd like to i'd like to to uh ask my first question to uh 
su Maurizio Mencuccini, um, uh, because he said, he told us that, that the uh, forests uh, uh, show reactions to, 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 to the effects of droughts and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think it's very, a very important question uh, for all of us as whether um, national regeneration in forests will be able to cope itself with the with the uh, effects of drought or uh, or should we say that if you want forests to uh, to survive to droughts we need to help them by planting maybe uh, other species or other uh, varieties provenances and so forth i know this is a very difficult question so all of my questions will be very complicated so we don't need to give a definite answer but i think it's important for us, uh, the scientists, who provide um, an idea of the span of our knowledge and the confidence we have in, in what we say. Thanks, Maurizio. Uh, thank, thanks, Ivan. Yeah, indeed, these uh, very broad questions that can be looked at from many different angles. I would say as a start that um, I think having evidence of um, a successful natural regeneration is always uh, an indicator that uh, uh, that component of uh, the management and the life, in fact, of the forest is working well. It means that uh, not only the characteristics of the species in terms of their traits <clears throat> are uh, um, okay, they are good, but they are also matched to the site condition and both uh, soil and climate. So it's uh, an issue of um, Going back to one aspect I raised in my talk, the matching between sort of the endogenous parts of the organism, the, it's in, a, in, for in this case, the vulnerability to drought and the exposure of the environment. And so <clears throat> having a good evidence of natural regeneration always suggests that the traits of the species are matched to the site. <clears throat> That's one aspect. The, the other aspect I wanted to raise is <clears throat> that uh, it's... Um, in terms of, of, of contrasting natural regeneration against planting, is that uh, we obviously we are not at the stage of um, being able to select individuals for their specific traits uh, for practical purposes in forests. Yet we can we have a, a limited uh, number of examples where provenances can be selected based on specific traits which are not related purely to. Uh, to growth, but perhaps to uh, other elements that may be favorable during drought conditions. But in general, again, the matching of those uh, genotypes to the sites requires substantial uh, knowledge about the specific site conditions in the same way that we can obtain already from the matching of the natural regeneration to site conditions. So I, I would say that uh, <clears throat> favoring, favoring diversity of, uh, um, of uh, uh, different components in ecosystems, in, in this case, also different species, is always a positive step in ensuring that the forest as a whole is resilient uh, to drought events. Thank you, Maurizio. Does anybody else want to uh, add anything to this? May, <clears throat> may I add something? Thanks. This um, is Jordi Martinez from CREAF as well. Yes, please. Hello, so, so Besides what, what Maurizio said, as he said, there are many way, many perspectives to, that we can use to look into this. But I think it, another important aspect is that we have many examples of natural regeneration involving the same species that used to dominate the forest that was affected by a drought, but also good examples of situations in which it's different species that were, were represented in the forest that were not dominant that end up dominating the forest after one or several sequential droughts. So I think it's important to distinguish between these situations in which we end up with a forest that is similar in composition and probably in structure to the one we had before and those in which the resulting forest is quite different. And there are examples really in several places showing that this is the directional towards, in, many, in some cases, for example, towards uh, in, shrublands or shrub species that were already presented regionally but were not dominating in these areas. And these are normally more drought resistant, of course, than the forest species we had initially. Okay, thank you very much, Jordi, for this compliment. Um, right. Um, so um, if there's 
Nobody, uh, nothing else to add to this first point. I'd like to turn to uh, Aida and Delphine and talk a little bit more about genetics and evolution. Um, I just, uh, well, I take this opportunity just to say that uh, uh, the talk we have heard uh, has focused on our Mediterranean trees and forests, but of course, uh, other uh, many other species are studied, and they have uh, also a, a quite good level of knowledge um, uh, in uh, about the, the genetic basis of the response to drought. We didn't have the time to discuss this here, but it's not limited. Uh, that our knowledge is not limited to the species that grow in places that are already currently exposed to to frequent droughts. We know that. Drought affects also more northern forests, but we also have knowledge on on those on those forests. But the question I wanted to ask to Delphine and 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 Ida, you you decide who, who goes first, or if you want to go both, or only one of two of, of you two, as <clears throat> uh, that drought stress, as I already had um, mentioned in my introduction, doesn't happen alone. And so there are other stressors and there are other traits, other characters that are related, correlated to drought response. So uh, a, a general question is, how uh, how is adaptation to drought stress constrained by the fact that there are also other uh, characteristics of trees, uh, for example, response to cold that could be uh, connected and how does the response to one stress limit the uh, the possibility to use the genetics to adapt uh, to other stresses okay delphine if you would like i i can go with it yeah please okay so um yeah as you said uh, yes populations are not adapted just to one environmental factor because in the environment, all uh, climatic factors come together. So there is increasing evidence that uh, the response to drought is coupled also with the response to minimum temperatures. They are uh, combined. There are some traits that can respond to both. And even though in Mediterranean, we always think that aridity is the main driver of adaptations. There is increasing evidence that also temperatures in winter have a strong impact. On the other hand, eh, there could be some trade-offs. So the more you respond to drought um, could mean that the less you are able to uh, cope with some pests on some uh, biotic interactions. And also that the responses are not just one trait, they don't respond with height or uh, changing physiological conditions. So taking into account all the interactions within one individual, they have to respond uh, in proteomics, uh, in, in all the factors together. And uh, perhaps you can see that there are some slow growing trees, but this could be an adaptive uh, response to uh, environmental stressors. So it doesn't mean that they are that they are doing uh, bad in that conditions. Thank you very much, Ida. Does anybody else want to comment, including Delphine, of course? So I just wanted to add that uh, I didn't enter into details at the molecular level, but there are also, it, it is known that some genes, they can also answer or be linked to, to different phenotypes. For example, the, in drought, you, we know that the dehydrin involved in the response to drought, they're also in, involved in the response to cold. So that's another layer that we should, there, there are like a, red, a network of genes that are involved in these answers to many phenotypes. Hmm. Right, thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll now turn to uh, to Stefan Mori, who has convinced us absolutely of the importance of uh, the epigenetic effects. Uh, more in, in more in detail, 
Um, Ivan, there is a question in the chat about uh, this. If we can, we'll, we'll take it later. We'll take it. Ah, later. okay. Um, the uh, one question could be, what's uh, do do, do epigenetic mechanisms uh, take their effects throughout the, the the whole life cycle of a, of an organism or a tree of a tree in particular, and how they how, what what's the balance between uh, the effect of the let's say hardwired genetic effects and the epigenetic effects. Well, how how do they compare in 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 importance of effects? Do we know anything Com about this? Comparing between what and what between between the 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 genetic proper difference variation and the epigenetic effects. Do we know anything about this? And how 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 do the epigenetic effects roll out throughout the life of an individual? Okay, so the first part about the age, uh, reaching up to the question there. In fact, we have not actually the answer about how epigenetic can affect all the life stage, more precisely young or old. But many reports show that as young as you take the biological material, the most the effect of epigenetic are big because simply it's a developmental process. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you include the epigenetic marks at the embryo stage or very juvenile stage, you have chance that it's transmitted during the life of the organisms to all the tissue or the functioning of the organisms. So if it's coming later, the effect are maybe less important, but we must remind that plants have post-embryonic development. So for plants, contrary to animals, development is all the life of the plants, so for trees, for all the life of the tree, so epigenetic can arise on young tissues or the life of a tree. So there is no specific uh, age and we don't know more. To cope with the idea of genetic versus uh, epigenetic and how they react, interact, this leads to the question to mostly genetic and epigenetic of population. And this is just an emerging thematic for which there is only the first papers and articles since few years, two, three years. Of course, there is some older, but very preliminary. So we don't know exactly, but what we can say with a system like Poplar, because we can do clones, is that we can uh, use no genetic diversity using clones and find how epigenetic can be important for the dwarf response. And this is already quite nicely shown. We can also only affect the epigenetic variability with uh, modified lines and show that it's important to define the drought response. So everything is not clear at the population level, but for the concept, both have a place, probably in synergy. Right, thanks. Which means that, of course, there's an, a, a very large avenue of research that we need to take to explore this variability in, in wild populations about the genetics and epigenetics of response to drought. Yeah, thanks. Any any comments, additional comments on this question from the panelists? Maybe I can say something. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, just to complement what has just been said, really, uh, that uh, all plants uh, and also therefore trees have this fantastic ability of um, being modular. They grow in individual units, which they then multiply themselves uh, so that they are extremely plastic in the sense of uh, being able to exploit resources locally wherever they occur, both in terms of how they grow below ground in the roots uh, and above ground exploited light. So th therefore, there is, yeah, there is that dimension that affects really younger trees a lot more than older mature trees, which have their structure built up and therefore they also accumulate potentially all the damages, all the problems, all the uh, <clears throat> inertia that has been built through uh, centuries often of uh, of uh, living in a single in a, in a particular place. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I just want to want to ask one last question from my side for to our last speaker. Uh, Ms. Demirtas, who has shown the example examples of uh, uh, research uh, research in uh, in Turkey about about uh, the response of trees to drought and stress, 
the I, I really like I, we know that Turkey is really both uh, at the at the core of a biodiversity hotspot but also uh, very highly exposed to extreme situations so if in your opinion what are the the biggest environmental challenges in terms of soil conditions and uh, climate and so on and so forth that 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 uh, Turkish forests are exposed to currently and in in the in the in the next few years what do you think about they really are the be the worst things that could happen the, the 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 most extreme events actually we have many problems about this but and the most important problem in my opinion uh drought because uh, we don't get enough uh, precipitation uh, in recent years and it's really affecting the, uh, the some regions uh, uh, middle part of the country and the east part uh, also I see the, some presentation uh, I don't remember now uh, there was a uh, pinus pinia and Turkey. Uh, we have the pinus pinia in part of the Turkey. Uh, these are uh, really important and their fruit is really expensive. But uh, now uh, temperature is uh, affecting them. The high temperature is affecting and they didn't get any uh, uh, any fruit uh, from them and they are now cutting the old trees and they will replant them and it was really important and for the region uh, it's also my hometown Izmir maybe you know the Izmir is, is uh, agency uh, next to agency and and yeah, shortly is drought and extreme temperatures and less precipitation is really a big problem for the uh, forest and agriculture areas in Turkey. I can say this. All right. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers. Uh, I think I'll, like, I'll now uh, uh, return the uh, floor to Yulia, who is going to... Uh, uh, represent the questions that have been asked through the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we indeed have now some questions also coming from the chat. The first one is from Marilyn Haddad. And it is, the question says, the ability of a species to reproduce is very important for its survival. The modification of the reproductive organs and the adaptation of animals working as a reproductive vector to climate change. These two variables affect the genetic diversity and are affected by climate change. Do you plan to evaluate these variables? If yes, how? I guess this goes to either Maurizio or Delphine and Aida. I think it covers both of answer? us. <laughs> I will begin, but I think it is a question that involves both uh, talks. So I'll. Um, as part of uh, the work that we do, uh, <clears throat> we are not directly assessing the uh, fructification part or the seed production part, although I completely agree with the um, opinion expressed in the chat about the significance of um, <clears throat> the reproductive phases um, for the success of natural regeneration. And the reason why we are not doing it is simply because of lack of resources and lack of time and uh, therefore the need to focus on um, some of the fundamental properties. Uh, <clears throat> uh, having said that, the processes by which, um, many of the processes by which um, uh, uh, flowers or seeds can fail, physiological, are similar to the ones that control the failure of other organs, like leaves or wood, in response to drought. So there is a similarity there. There are many points of contact that uh, we plan to explore in the future. Over to you, Delphine. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I was working on, on this topic on, on uh, seed dispersal and animals during my postdoc. 
And so there are studies going on on, on this. And, and what they are doing is that the, the stroke genetic markers, they are following the seeds and, and where they are coming from. And of course, there is this mutualism between, uh, for example, in, in oaks or in other species where, where the, the birds or the squirrels, they, they get the seeds, they bury them, they forget them, and then they germinate. So we know that, that the seeds dispersed away from the mother tree, they are more diverse genetically. And, and it's good for the survival of the species because they will present more, more genetic diversity. So they will adapt better to future conditions. Uh, and I, of course, I, I, the, the climate change will also affect this disperser. So this is like a global uh, network with, uh, between the trees and the, and the, and the disperser that should, we should take into account. And, and we should also look at the, at the post-dispersal stage of these seeds because we need to be sure that the seedlings and the saplings, they will adapt to the new conditions. So we should also have some work on, on adaptation of the seedlings, not only the first, the, the, the adults should produce seeds and, first, and second, the, the, when they are dispersed, the seedlings uh, should, should flourish and give next, uh, give the floor to the next generation. Thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting question and interesting answer as well, and new to me. And now we do have two questions for the epigenetics. So Chris Watson from the Forestry Commission in England asks, does epigenetic adaptation occur more effective, effectively depending upon the life stage of a tree? For example, is is a young tree able to adjust more quickly than a mature tree? Stefan. So yes, as I say, globally, what the studies show is that the youngest material is more able to imprint epigenetic uh, uh, environmental uh, modifications. So we know that embryo or young tissues are much more, or meristematic tissues are much more able to imprint environmental variation at the epigenetic state and pro propagate that mitotic uh, transmission, or if it is shoot apical bud, to uh, next generation. But as I say, post-embryonic development is continuous in trees. So there is always young tissues emerging in terms of ontogeny. So they can always propagate this. And if it is more related to the tree age, physiological age, we don't know exactly a actually the difference of epigenetic between trees that are very different in age. There is not enough report to say that we have a general view of that. Thank you very much. There is another question to you, Stefan, from Laura Guillardin. And first of all, she says also great presentation on epigenetics and is wondering if one of the potential end goals would be to develop material from epigenetic adapted trees. Do we know how long this methylation marks or changes last? Okay, so yes, the idea will be to what we call prime material. So there is a priming effect now that is well known in plants is that when you challenge the first time with a stress, that could be an epigenetic uh, imprint and memory that allow a better answer during the second challenge. So if this is true in some species, model plant like uh, Aridopsis, tomato, where priming is now well known, we only have a few reports on trees' ability to do priming, but there is already some reports of biotic and abiotic priming in trees. So we know that it exists. We don't know exactly all the things about that. So yes, it could be promising to have prime material, prime seeds or prime cuttings that we could after put in more stressful environment and that could maybe uh, keep this priming effect at least at the first step of their uh, development. We know that priming can be transmitted through generation, but we don't know the occurrence of each time of the priming effect. Sometimes it can be reversed and very short time. Sometimes it can be maintained for months, Sometimes it can be transmitted to the next generation. So the concepts are, this is possible at each stage, but we don't have enough report to answer on three spaces what will happen each time. So we need more investigation to measure this uh, ability to be a stable priming. 
the concepts are there, but evidence for all the details are still not there. Thank you again. Then I have one more question that I will take from the chat. However, if you have more questions, please feel free to post them and we can always uh, contact you and provide an answer later on. So the question is from Zeda Yegu from Turkey. And the question is to Delphine and Aida. I would especially like to ask if you have done research on red pine, Pinus brutia, because red pine is a very important species in Turkey in terms of adaptation to drought. I can answer, Aida, if you want. So we are collaborating, in fact, uh, uh, with a colleague in, in uh, we just published an article on uh, Pinus brutia in Turkey uh, using chloroplast microsatellite. So these are, I think, the, the most updated data that we have uh, from for Pinus brutia. And the species show a lot of variability compared to Pinus alepensis, the, the, the closest species that uh, exists. And, and I think there are also speech, uh, studies going on um, uh, uh, looking at the at gene flow between the two species. So yeah, there are works going on on the species. Thank you very much. I hope this was answering all your questions for the moment. I will, would like to now also conclude with the summary of this webinar. So we did learn about the physiology of trees during and after drought, what happens to trees under drought and the differences of tree responses to drought. We also learned about the genetic basis of such variations. How does drought stress vary among species, among populations, and also among individual trees and why it matters. We were able to get an insight into epigenetics, the functional impact of epigenetic variation in forest trees, and what's in it for tree adaptation. And finally, we were offered a vision of the ongoing genetic research carried out on pear, hawthorn and poplar to determine the possibilities of using them for afforestation in arid to semi-arid areas in Turkey. I think most importantly, we, were, we learned that genetic diversity, although it is often an unseen ally, as the title of our webinar says, it is essential to guarantee healthy forests and their potential for ad adaptation in these uncertain times. And with this, I actually would like to conclude with the promotion uh, I... for our next webinar, continuing with the topic of drought stress. Yes? Can I Sorry, contribute? That was, uh, someone from. Uh, can I contribute? Who's this? Sorry, I can't see Sardar. who's speaking. Okay, uh, we will finish now with the online streaming, mm -hmm. and then you can contribute maybe in the question and answer section afterwards. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. So, actually, Santiago, if you could. Uh, show the last the almost last slide of my presentation where i am talking about the next webinar on the 17th of may one more slide so i would like to end this uh, webinar with the promotion for our next webinar continuing with the topic of drought stress. So it will take place on the 17th of May. So please mark your calendars and it will be with another set of interesting presentations on the drought stress in Central Europe, mostly affecting beach, but also on the development of a decision support tool for mixed forest stands and the effects of thinnings on drought tolerance of forests on a short term, uh, positive effects likely, and on pine and mistletoe and providing insights from the measures taken in Poland and Switzerland and latest research. So more information will be available soon on our website and in the social media. So just stay tuned. So thank you all, and especially the speakers for their grand presentations. And please, we will now close the online streaming and the experts, please stay connected in the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Just a short moment, please.